to another episode of the Shaken and Stirred show. I know you're probably listening to this podcast, but if you have the chance to actually watch the podcast, which you can on YouTube, you'll see that I have a rather incredible suntan. Yes, people, I've been away. I know you might have missed me for a week, but I'm back and I'm back and I'm browner than ever and happy for it too. And I've got a wonderful, wonderful guest for you this week. Well worth waiting for. Our guest this week has an incredible story, as so many of our guests do. A prolific entrepreneurial career already. And I'm on a bit of an entrepreneurial kick, you may have noticed. If you look at the lineup we've had in the past few weeks, past few months, there are a few incredible branding, marketing geniuses. Well, our guest today is no less. And he's also the CEO of Greater New Orleans, Inc., the number two economic development organization in the nation. He worked for Mayor Bloomberg as an assistant commissioner. And to shake and stir things up at night, he goes by DJ El Camino. <laughs> <laughs> already it's making me laugh and i you know i'm a big fan of new orleans please welcome michael hecht michael how are you uh nigel i'm really well and i'm thrilled to be with you and um yeah only only in new orleans could all of those things come together and make sense like like a complicated uh cocktail that shouldn't work but when you take a sip it all uh, it all comes together on the tongue so you told me now you, i just heard at least that you have been dry for the past 42 days is that for lent tragically that's true no it's really not for lent exactly i'm more old testament myself um it's because uh, my wife is doing a phd in aging studies um and so she wanted to take a a, a, a quintet of us or a group of us uh more aged people and see what would be the the impact beneficial or otherwise of not drinking during this lent period and we we did this with a local hospital system called oxford they've got something called alcohol free for, for 40 and they try to make it fun and they give you swag and they they encourage you and it's actually just desperately boring it sounds i mean first of all the thought of giving it up for 40 days and trying to make it fun by giving you swag in itself sounds extraordinary but you are having a drink now with us on the shaken and stirred show what is it i am i'm, I'm having one of one of my favorites uh a, a french 75 a classic drink that came to uh new orleans uh by by france via paris i think where it was uh, uh harry's new york bar back in world war one it was originally invented uh, i believe back in in, in paris so it, a lot of things happened at harry's bar in paris by the way, um, and Harry's Bar was relocated to the, to the US, don't forget, after that point. Now, did you make this yourself, the, this French 75 of yours? No, I have to say, unfortunately, because it was a work day and, and, I, and I was busy, I was literally on a, on a Zoom call um, with Ukraine earlier, so I was unable to attend to these more delightful things in life. But it was bought from one of our local restaurants, um, not actually the most iconic one, which is Arno's French 75 Bar in the French Quarter, which is one of the top five bars in the country, but it still should be a beautiful um, gin base. I usually go for the gin um, instead of the cognac, even though I know the cognac is a little bit more classic, the gin's a little bit um, cleaner. And so it should have all, everything in it, the, the, the lemon, the sugar. Um, it smells like sunshine. Um, and if I, if I made Nigel, oh, perfect. You oh, know, really? I you decided did to go along with you, but me, I being the classic one, I've made myself a French 75 with cognac. Um, oh. I've actually used a little Hennessy. And, and to everyone out there, the French 75, if you're not familiar with it, you've got to make it one for yourself or order one. It is an absolute classic. It's one of the few American classics invented during Prohibition. And oh. there's a lot of argument or conversation, as there are with all great cocktails, as to the provenance of the French 75. A lot of people claim to have invented it, when the fact of the matter is, like most cocktails, they're not really invented by one person or another. It is, you know, really, it's whoever gave it a name is the sort of the person who invented it. Because there's, if you, with the French 75, if you start looking at the history, 1927 is the sort of first time it, it was um, sort of called the French 75. Um, and it, it, sort of, it became very famous after that. And that's named after this French artillery gun that was a very fast, rapid fire and caused a lot of problems um, during that period. And because it was such a hardcore gun, this cocktail, which is also a pretty hardcore cocktail and will knock you on your ass if you're not careful, um, just like the French 75 gun was given this name. But 
if you predate that, uh, you'll you'll see that um, there, there, it actually predates back to about 1867 when Charlie Chaplin, I believe, um, used to be staying in Boston and he had a, a drink which was very similar, which was brandy or cognac alongside champagne cups. And champagne cups are, are simply bubbly champagne, uh, citrus and um, sugar. And then, of course, you add the cognac and you kind of have pretty much the same thing, which is what, you know, French 75 is. They just didn't call it that. Right. So interesting history. Reminds me of what of what Winston Churchill said when he was asked if he was going to be uh, remembered fondly when people wrote history. And he said, yes, because I intend to write it. So I guess uh, to he or she who names the drink belongs is the the name of the drink but um regardless there are very few drinks that can look as demure as this but kind of change your entire outlook on life as quickly as the french 75 so it's it's a it's quite a punch in, a, in an elegant package absolutely so and for all of you out there trying to make one it's about it's one shot or one part uh brandy or gin um and you're going to do about a half an ounce of lemon juice um and some people try lime i like lemon always uh, uh, with sugar and a sugar cube and not how you'd normally make that is you get your mixer you put the sugar in there the lemon in there you give that a bit of a mix up you then throw your your ice in there and also your gin give that a shake and then you're going to pour that into your champagne flute and then fill that up with champagne and if you are at Arnaud's in new orleans where they make the one of the probably one of the best french 75s in the world you know you have a choice of different champagnes and believe me the better than champagne the better it tastes just like most cocktails the ingredients really matter and although we like to say ah why bother wasting a good champagne on a drink like this it's well worth it and each different champagne has its different taste no 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 it's it's not a waste it's a warship and uh there actually is another derivation here for those particularly which are most of the days in the year here you can go to some restaurants particularly superior sea grill sea uh, seafood grill and they do a frozen french 75 and the combination of the the strength of the ingredients and the sweetness and the acid but in a frozen form um it's um you know it's it's like from that quentin tarantino film when she gets the shot of adrenaline into the heart except so much nicer <laughs> cheers, my friend. On that note, um, I'll, cheers, I'll drink to you. you. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Mm. Delicious. And hopefully we don't get too sloppy by, in the, by the end of this particular podcast. I think one is one, one and done on this one. For, anyway, but so let's get into it. You've got such an interesting career. You, you know, you've, you, you went to uh, Yale. Um, you um, have you, you went to Stanford. Um, you, you know, you've worked for Bloomberg, you know, when he was the mayor there in New York City. Um, you now are the CEO of GNO, um, Greater New Orleans. I mean, you, the sort of list goes on and on, but you are from White Plains, New York, are you not? Well, yeah, yeah yes and no. So my, my mother is actually from New Orleans. Um, okay. But she happened to marry a Yankee. So I grew up in New York. I was actually born in Manhattan uh, and then grew up in White Plains, which was yeah, a suburb of of new york city and really kind of grew up with a very kind of uh suburban existence in the 70s and 80s which was a nice time to grow up i mean that was you know back before you needed to really wear seat belts and cigarettes weren't bad for you and it was a it was a it was a it was a simpler time you know the worst thing you had to worry about was acid wash jeans um and but i i really started traveling after um, undergraduate, and I ended up working in Australia and, and in Europe and uh, met my wife, who's Danish, when I was actually working in Australia, had our first date uh, in New Zealand. And um, she actually did both of her degrees in England. So that's really, it was really after university, I started traveling so much and uh, developed a real appreciation for the cultures and, and you know, to be fair, the cocktails uh, of, of the world. No, it's funny because I, you know, I've read a bit about you and I've, I've certainly looked at a few interviews and some of your TED talks and, and what have you. And I hear that you are a bit of a rugby head. And in fact, you you got in, you got a, a head injury playing rugby back in the day when you were at, at college, was it? Yeah. So, you know, to, to borrow a line from Casablanca, shocked, shocked that I was injured playing rugby. I was uh, when I was young, I was I, was, I played soccer and I, and I wrestled. And so I tended to lead with my head as you do in wrestling. And that, that was, didn't work at, as well playing rugby when I was a scrum and a fly half. And I loved the sport. I think that rugby is 
an extraordinarily beautiful sport. It's it, it's it's really as if American football and 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 basketball and uh, and a jazz quartet kind of had a a love child. But I didn't play it correctly, and I with my head, and I got hit, and um, I uh, yeah woke up with a migraine uh, my senior year of college that I had for about a year and a half. So that was. Um, that was a, uh, you know, a, a real come down and a kind of real recognition of my of my mortality at you know, a pretty young age. Yeah, I actually played rugby myself for some time you know, as, as a child and as a young kid at high school and what have you. And it, I think uh, the reality is it's hard not to get concussion playing playing rugby either. I mean, it, although it's perhaps not as dangerous a sport as American football, you are still going in there most of the time, you know, blazing head first grabbing legs and it's pretty easy to get knocked about so I, I, mean, I think I had a couple of concussions playing rugby one time I even ran into the rugby posts I, I looked up I didn't see it and I just smacked my head straight into the post yeah that kind of thing will happen what, what, what do they say it's a, it's it's a rogues game played by gentlemen or something like that uh, it might <laughs> exactly. just be a rogues game played by ruffians or something but um you know but it is a beautiful sport I do actually think that What's interesting is that although you don't wear a helmet, the, the potential for a real serious injury is actually less than in American football because you don't have the repetition, right? And, and ironically or counterintuitively, the, the helmet and the padding of American football allows for repetitive uh, hits, repetitive concussive hits. And that's really what causes the long-term injury. So, um, you know, for you and me, we're more likely to dislocate a shoulder or lose a tooth. Um, I was, you know, unfortunate, but like all of those experiences um, in life, particularly, I think when you're young, they're humbling, but you, you, if you are lucky enough to emerge on the other side, you tend to come out wiser uh, with a greater appreciation, even a greater joy uh, for every day. And that certainly was, you know, was my experience. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's an, it's a, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, ultimately, no matter what you do in life, you know, it's all the hits are going to come, but it's how you pick yourself up afterwards and what you learn from them. You know, I, I mean, looking at your career, you started in, in pretty much in New York, right? Working for Bloomberg and getting into, you know, and especially all the things that have happened there. But you, what made you decide to sort of, I guess, after 9-11 to move back to New Orleans? What was that moment that you were like, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave here now. And I'm, because New York is such a city, but, and New Orleans is as well. But I feel like New Orleans has had its time or, or had had its time at that moment. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's two things that that happened. One is that, as I mentioned, my wife is Danish, and we were in San Francisco um, until the dot com crash. We had been in the restaurant business, and that was a blast. And I would tell you all about that time if I could remember it. But um, then we we decided that we wanted to see the country, so we traded in our little hipster Volkswagen hatchback for uh, you know a Westphalia um, camper van, and we went around North America. Um, we went about fifteen thousand miles over nine weeks. And it was wonderful. And, and the United States is a beautiful country and the people are extraordinary and you really have to go on the back roads to get the experience. But when we came through New Orleans, my wife turned to me and she said, you know, we should move to New Orleans. It's the only place in America you actually know where you are. And, um, you know, I think she's right. This is a place that looks different. It feels different. Quite frankly, it smells different in New Orleans uh, for a number of reasons, good and, and not so savory. Um, but, you know, what I said to her is that's true. But to your point, Nigel, this was a place that had its heyday, um, you know, maybe in the 60s and 70s right. and had really been an objective decline, you know, since the 80s. So I said, that's all well and good. But, you know, if we're not independently wealthy um, or I'm not a jazz musician, what would I do there? And so what was interesting is that we were then in New York. I was working for Bloomberg doing post 9-11 business recovery work. Um, when Katrina hit. And um, that ended up being the work opportunity because they came to see us to ask about how we were helping to support businesses post-disaster and how we were accessing federal funds. And I kind of let drop that I had, um, you know, some family roots in, in Louisiana. And uh, three months later, I was on the steps of the state capitol um, announcing a quarter billion dollar federal program with the uh, governor, uh, Governor Blanco, who, uh, which I had no idea how it was going to run, but I knew that I was home. And so, um, you know, it was a um, really kind of unplanned uh, career path and route that got me back home, but it's been an extraordinary 16, 17 years since we've been back. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 quite remarkable what's happened um, to New Orleans, you know, in in the past you know decade or so. I mean, I I'm I'm someone who you know coming from England, New Orleans has always had a sort of mystical almost sort of vibe to it. You know, you you you've seen it in movies and you've read about it and you know you visit it, you know, but it is a place that you visit and then you end up sort of tending to perhaps to have a hurricane too many or something and you know a beignet too many and you, you know the last thing you want you're like I, I have to I have to leave New Orleans now I must leave New Orleans now before I, unless I never leave New Orleans <laughs> um but it, but it's it's changed a lot and I remember being there probably about 15 years ago and you know having a dinner with some you know rather fancy guests or fa fancy people who live there rather and I was the guest and but I, I was I remember being shocked by these gentlemen who told me that how dangerous it was at the time to be in New Orleans. And, the, you know, the, one of them was a dentist, two were lawyers, mm -hmm. and they were all packing guns. And I'd never oh. experienced anything like that by myself at that point. And I, I was so shocked that these sort of seem, what, what seemed like very normal men at a, at a party had guns on them, including one strapped to his ankle. And, um, it, and it was a, a moment when I said to my wife, who's from Alabama, um, from Point Clear, Fairhope, Alabama. I was um, there last weekend with, with the petunias and the curb cuts. There you go. So, you know, so you, I, I'm familiar with the area very well. And I love New Orleans. And I fly in there all the time to visit family down there, my wife's family and what have you. And um, But I, I said to her at the time, I'm like, you know, I love New Orleans, but I, I'm not sure I could live there if this is the case. But a lot has changed since then, right? And 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 a lot of and business has changed dramatically. Tell me about what, in, in, in your perspective, um, was the changing point. How what made it change? Other than Katrina, because Katrina could have destroyed, completely destroyed New Orleans, but instead it gave it an opportunity. Yeah, and that that's I think so often the case with an individual or with a city or even even with with a nation. In fact, we were talking about it on our phone call this morning with Ukraine, with the Ukraine Business School, that um, these types of crises, the way I think about it is if we've all had a friend who was overweight and drank too much, smoked, uh, wasn't taking care of themselves, and they had a, a heart attack too young, or right? it's always had a heart attack, but it didn't kill them. It just scared the heck out of them. And as a result, they started running, started doing CrossFit, started you know wearing unitards and uh and it actually saved their life and because it, it it was the crisis that allowed them to change that gave them uh whether they gave them the fortitude or the opportunity just scared them enough to make the fundamental changes and katrina did that for new orleans it was uh as much a psychosocial impact as it was a physical one from the flooding and so I think it, it showed people that what we were doing before was not working. It was the images of poverty, of suffering, the inequity of the way the disaster affected people. And that combined with what ended up being, Nigel, about $140 billion that ultimately wow. came in through public and private sources, um, allowed uh, the people of New Orleans who are fiercely loyal to the soil, to this place, to rebuild back better than it had been before. And so um, the way I, I feel about it is that Katrina was, uh, was an inflection point. And what happened after that wasn't just resilience. It wasn't just re a return back to previous form. It was what we've described as radical resilience. It was actually mm -hmm. um, an inflection point where we came back better. And that was reflected in education reform, uh, in flood protection reform, in political reform. Uh, metaphorically, it was reflected in the Saints, the football team uh, winning the Super Bowl for the first time ever and maybe never to happen again. Um, and so I, I think that as strange as it is to say, absent the crisis and the loss of Hurricane Katrina, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today on this podcast toasting with French 75s talking about the success of New Orleans over the past decade. You yeah, know, I mean, almost cl clearly that's the, the, the case. I mean, I, I, I see similar traits in Detroit too, you know, in what's happened there in the past sort of mm -hmm. few years as well. I mean, it's an extraordinary re recovery. I mean, you, you mentioned radical resilience, and I know you've talked about this in TED Talks and things and what have you, and it, it's you know, obviously there are times when people bounce back to, to sort of back to where they were, but radical re um, resilience is going past that point, right? It's, it's taking it to that next level. It's 
and and how does that happen? I mean, it's one thing to win the Super Bowl, but it, it, and it, or is that an, or is that enough? Is it something as, as simple as winning the Super Bowl that you think gives everyone the, or is that just a part of the the part of the magic? I think it's a part of the magic. I think it's essential because you know sport sport is, is, is metaphor, and it and really in in New Orleans there's two official religions, Catholicism and the Saints, and so they're incredibly important spiritually as well, and. When the Superdome was flooded, was destroyed basically by Katrina, but it was then rebuilt in six months. And the first game to come back, we were playing our arch rivals, um, the Atlanta Falcons, on September 25th, 2006. And when Steve Gleason, who is now a hero for his fight against ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, when he blocked the kick and, and the Saints went on to score a touchdown uh, and to beat our rivals, the Falcons, everybody was crying in the stands and, and YouTube was playing, the Saints are coming. And they weren't crying just because we beat Atlanta, although typically that was enough reason to, sure. uh, to have tears of joy. It was because we knew at that moment that we weren't going to lose the Saints. There was a risk of them moving to Texas, but now we knew they were going to stay. And we actually somehow intuited that they were going to be better than before. And then we knew by extension that New Orleans was not going to go away and it was going to come back better than before. So that was maybe, Nigel, from a spiritual standpoint, that was essential but then from a practical standpoint, if you look at every single reform that has made New Orleans come back on a path better than before, in each and every case, there was one individual who decided that that was going to be their issue. And they brought many along with them. Um, obviously, the success is shared. But that one individual decided that, for example, they were going to make education reform um, their issue. And they had the intellectual horsepower um, and this, the, 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 the force of personality to drive the issue, bring others along and drive change within the, the, the context of the tumult of post-Katrina, when things were shaken up and could be changed and there was money to do it. So I think that these broad kind of um, social factors like the Saints winning the Super Bowl are essential for giving a context of success, hopefulness, but without doubt, um, you know, it takes one person or a small group of people committed to a cause to drive the change. It does not happen, you know, just organically. It does not happen just uh, because of a Browning in motion. What, what is Greater New Orleans Inc.'s actual role? What, 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 what do you do on the, on the ground? I mean, I, I'm just, you know, this is the company you're CEO of. And it's, you know, if you look at, I guess, New Orleans, NOLA, you know, Forbes is talking about it as being one of the greatest turnarounds in American history. What, what, what area are you helping to make that happen? I'll give you two answers to that. I'll give you kind of the, the uh, strategic answer, and then I'll give you the organizational answer, which is more important. So strategically, we do two things. We do business development, which is trying to bring in new companies uh, and, and support entrepreneurs. So, and then we do business environment. That's the second part of our shop. And that's about creating a better environment for business to operate in organically. So that's everything from tax policy to workforce programs to um, getting the British Airways flight uh, at, at the airports. You can get direct from London back to New Orleans. Anything that's going to help create an environment that organically is gonna be attractive to business, even brand work so that New Orleans is known for more than food music and Mardi Gras. Then on the other side, what GNO Inc. does, and this is something I didn't understand until a few years ago, is we're a tiny organization. We're 25 people. We have a small budget. We have no statutory power. The region doesn't really exist. It's not a real uh, political subdivision uh, in any way, but it actually is our very powerlessness that gives us power. Because we can't threaten anybody in a formal way, it allows us to play this role of like a Switzerland or a Luxembourg and sit in the middle and coordinate entities that would not otherwise work together to push towards a, a common goal. And so, uh, again, I'll give you an example that's near and dear to my heart and yours, I would assume as well, is getting British Airways here. Um, before Katrina, New Orleans had not had a direct flight to Europe since 1984, despite wow. being the most European American city. It's unbelievable, but it's true. Uh, we did a study, we, we learned, and we knew it, that London was our number one destination for business and for leisure travel. But to make that happen, we had to pull together the tourist organization, the airport, all of the businesses that would benefit from the flight, and the governor's office, and go to BA 
and say, New Orleans has changed. You need to look at this route. And also, by the way, you have an airplane now, the 787, that can make smaller direct point-to-point -point routes profitable. Um, and we did that for three years before we were successful. But had there not been a GNO Inc. that was serving as the, 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 the coordinator, the nexus for that effort, despite the fact that we have no aviation expertise, we didn't have any money to put into the deal, it just wouldn't have happened. And so we've used to use our powerlessness as a source of soft power to get projects done. Why do you think New Orleans is such a popular spot for the UK? Because both New Orleanians uh, and Brits have an intense sense of the absurdity and the majesty of humanity. I think there's a self-deprecation in both cultures that really resonates. I really do. I think that um, in both places, um, there's a culture of the cocktail in both, you know, sure. the UK and uh, in New Orleans, because you drink when you're happy to celebrate, you drink when you're sad to commiserate. Um, and I think it's that human connection that really, uh, really resonates between the two cultures, if that makes sense. Australians also, you know, love New Orleans. And, you know, Australians are just slightly tanner, wackier, you know, better looking Brits, right? Well, you know, we had to send them there for a reason. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, you're 100% right. You know, they are indeed. That's why we they, they annoyed us, obviously, enormously. So we sent them to the most beautiful place on earth. And uh, Right. You know, there you know, go. There's your punishment. punishment. Go, go make Australia. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we talk about a gift. There you go. Uh, best sentence ever. Um, but it's funny, New Orleans has this sort of romantic aspect to it. It, it has a sort of, in many ways, the best of so many places, yet there, there seems that there's always been this sort of abject poverty and, um, you know, and it has been, this, it, it, there, there are areas of New Orleans which are, uh, you know, historically, at least when I, from my own travels, when you go there, very ghetto-like, very sort of poor America, America that people don't see. Um, that often on television, it's sort of a almost a hidden part, and, and in many ways, Katrina opened that up for people to see. They were like, "Wow, this that? is America! You know, this is this is here. We this is us. This is our existence. What are we going to do?" Um, you know, was that was that a sort of a, a bit of a rallying cry as well for for the for the city or for the for the area or, or, or for the country? Do you think? Well, it was certainly a, a rallying cry for, I think, the, the city and the country. I think there was a collective sense of uh, embarrassment and even shame over, over the conditions. And those images haven't faded, right? Um, because I think what they exposed is, uh, I guess, what people call fourth world conditions, right? Mm -hmm. A first world country with third world conditions. Um, and, you know, the, the story of New Orleans, to go back to the beginning of your question, reveals why it's both so interesting and cosmopolitan and also why there's such poverty. Um, it's so interesting and cosmopolitan because, it, you know, it, it's a port city. It, it's why we bought one third of America from Napoleon. He needed the money and we wanted the port. Um, and its history is not only French and Spanish and English and German and Portuguese, but it's also strongly, strongly West African. And one of the reasons why New Orleans is the northernmost Caribbean city, or the reason why it's the northernmost Caribbean city, is that after the Haitian slave revolt in the 1790s, uh, when all of the Haitians who led the revolt were kicked out, black and white, they first went to Cuba, got kicked out of Cuba, and came to New Orleans. Uh, and of course, that's where the, the, a lot of the culture, a lot of the religion, jazz music uh, came from, was that uh, African sensibility. And so um, that's literally in the blood of, of New Orleans. It's, it is a mixed place, doesn't abide by the cultural or racial rules of the rest of the country. Most of Detroit or New York or DC are black and white when you think about black and white race relations. In New Orleans, it's tripartite. You have black, white, and Creole uh, and owned hierarchies. So there's a different background there. But, you know, one of the parts of New Orleans that's not spoken about nearly as much as it should be is that it was also the largest slave trading port in America. And a lot of the riches 
of, of the South coming through New Orleans were based on a combination of commodities and free slave labor. That's led to two consequences that we're trying to fix today. One is the uh, historical uh, racial uh, inequality, recognizing that a lot of folks, people of color who are free people of color or who have the means left and they were part of the great migration north to cities like Chicago uh, and New York. Um, the other thing that it did, which is at a whole another deeper level, is this is a place that grew very rich or where a certain class of people grew very rich for a long time by extracting commodities out of the ground and culture out of people and just selling it off. And that worked until it didn't. And it stopped working when places like Houston or Dallas or Atlanta or Iceland or Israel that didn't have the natural resources, natural commodities. So they had to have better structures, better processes, more disciplined value added economies began to surpass us. And what we're trying to do now with our work, for example, in offshore wind or our work in technology is to begin to have a, an economy based on intellectual capital and value added processes not one just based on commodities and, and, and free labor. Um, and so, of course, what we're seeing today is the continuation of something that started 400 years ago. Uh, uh, and some of the manifestations are glorious and, and wonderful, and some of them are tragic. And I think um, Katrina revealed both. This week's episode of Shaken and Stirred is brought to you by Masterworks. Masterworks gives investors access to a whole new asset class, blue chip art. Did you know that blue chip contemporary art outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 to 2020? And contemporary art prices have appreciated 14% annually on average during that time. Thanks to Masterworks, you don't have to have millions of dollars to own contemporary art. Unlike NFTs or cryptocurrency, art is a real tangible asset, just like real estate. But unlike a house or land, you can actually transport this asset and you can sell it anywhere in the world in any currency. The Wall Street Journal recently called the art market to be amongst the hottest on earth and shaken and stirred listeners can get in on the action by going to masterworks.art slash shaken and get started investing in art today. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Again, shaken and stirred listeners can get in on the action by going to masterworks.art slash shaken and get started investing in art today. The past few years have been extraordinary for New Orleans. And, you know, you talk about something called the exit effect, um, you know, with, with these extraordinary companies that have been that have started up in, in New Orleans over the past few years. Talk to us about what, what, what that means and, and, and why and, and how, you know, how you attract this kind of business. And, and, and I guess, you know, wh wh why is the success so extraordinary in New Orleans right now? Yeah, and just to be clear for the listeners, the, the exit effect is not the same as the axe effect. The axe effect is when you put on a teenage deodorant and what happens. Um, the different. exit effect is to do with entrepreneurs just to be... 100% you know, sure. To clarify. Although we might have to create our own exit um, deodorant after this. I would like, I would, I would use that if it would, if it would, if it would give me a, a billion dollar exit um, while keeping me dry. So um, there, there are really three ways that you, three uh, elements of economic development on the business development side. There are, there's corporate attraction. That's like landing an Amazon HQ2. There's uh, corporate retention that's keeping an existing company and helping it grow. Um, and then there's entrepreneurship, starting new companies. And the sad reality is that going back to certainly the 80s and actually before then, New Orleans lost a lot of its headquarters as they moved to places that had better business conditions like Houston. So we were in a place post Katrina where we only had one corporate uh, Fortune 500 headquarters left. And we recognized we needed to now grow new ones. So we started an effort to support entrepreneurship, uh, particularly in the technology realm. Um, that takes some time. And so now 10, 15 years later, uh, where we've had uh, years of financial support, of cultural support, of social support, in this past year, partially because of timing and partially because there was so much cash sloshing around the world during the COVID era, uh, we had uh, over a dozen exits uh, which totaled about $2.5 billion uh, of sales price, 
which collectively uh, really instantly put about a billion dollars of new capital into the economy to the owners, the investors, and the employees. And this is so important on, on many levels. Um, first of all, it creates new wealth, uh, which can be reinvested. Second of all, it creates new companies. So for example, uh, the owner of Lucid, which was our first unicorn, has started a new company, which is a Web3 application of Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is going to just wow. go gangbusters. Uh, it creates new philanthropy because these newly wealthy individuals invest in schools. So for example, uh, one of our, the owners of one of our companies uh, invested $5 million in a new engineering school at his alma mater. But I think most importantly, Nigel, um, it creates, it makes explicit for others who are considering being entrepreneurs, what that path can look like and why the journey might be worth it. And I think that now that one life cycle has been complete, the VCs from around the world now looking at this market um, as a potential place for investment, you're going to see new uh, entrepreneurs stepping in because they now see what the model can look like. And it really begins to turn the flywheel of entrepreneurship, which we've seen in other markets like Austin, for example, yes, uh, exactly. let alone you know the Bay Area, You know how powerful it can be over time. Um, in Austin, it started with Dell Computer, right? It was the Dellionaires. Uh, in Detroit, as you mentioned, it's Dan Gilbert, right, coming out of Quicken, who's making all the investments. And so maybe um, we're having our, our Dell or um, you know, Dan Gilbert moment. Who's moving to New Orleans? Where, who, who are the people that are coming to help with the workforce? So we've had different waves. Um, after Katrina, uh, we had um, thousands of people move here from around the country who wanted to be part of rebuilding one of the most unique cities in America. And I was quoted in the paper somewhat infamously as calling for some people Peace Corps with better food. And I didn't mean that like it sounded. I meant it, I meant it in the nicest way. Um, what you're seeing now is something different and it's a result of COVID. So, you know, economic development pre-COVID was what we would kind of pejoratively call elephant hunting. It was about how could you offer for the deepest incentives to land the biggest company. And kind of the, the depth of that was Amazon HQ2 when the city of Tucson gave Jeff Bezos a large cactus. Well, you know, that didn't work because last time somebody gave me a large cactus, I took the message differently. But anyway, <laughs> right? But um, it was that model. Now, um, because you no longer have to be, for example, in the Empire State Building in Midtown Manhattan, uh, because remote work has become acceptable, it's an enormous mar uh, opportunity for secondary and tertiary markets like New Orleans that previously really wouldn't have been able to compete against a London or a New York or a Bay Area because we didn't have the density, right, of the companies and the capital and the talent. So a lot of the people that are moving here now are folks that used to work for Spotify, for example, in the Empire State Building in Midtown Mid Manhattan, folks who worked for Twitter uh, or for, for Meta or for Square in San Francisco. Uh, we have individuals in, in the film industry who are now moving here. Um, we have people in finance who are now moving here. And so we think that not only for New Orleans, but for any market that's under you know, a $5 million like in Atlanta, this is a new golden age where if you can offer the right quality of life at the right price point and decent broadband, then you have an opportunity to build your tax base and your talent base in a way that was unimaginable two years ago. Um, there's a great stat from the Wall Street Journal. I read that pre-COVID, 4% of businesses had remote work in their business plan. Today, it's 42%. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And it ain't gonna, you know, and it might shrink back a little bit because you need to be around people really to do culture and training and sales. But um, I was talking to a friend who works for Disney and, uh, and no offense to Disney if they're watching or listening to this podcast, but he said that uh, if they forced him back to their office, he would just go work for somebody else. And I think that message is being heard particularly uh, for tech and, and white collar workers. Are, are you seeing that? Are you hearing that from other people? A hundred percent. I mean, I think that there's, there's no doubt that the world is a very, very different place. And it's the, if and it was already happening, it was moving that direction already. 
in COVID was the push that allowed people to, or forced people rather, to to realize that they you know had to work from home and or you know were needed to work from home and actually could work from home. And then the question was, well, where should home be? You know, so. Yeah, and, and therefore, you know, do I wish to live in the woods or do I wish to live in the mountains or do I want to live on the water or, or some small town? What can people expect to um, experience if they relocate to New Orleans? What What is the quality of life like now? So I think there's, I, I would, first I kind of give, a, give a, a bit of a caveat that two thirds of people who come to New Orleans uh, fall in love and are, are infected by this place and, and, uh, and they can never leave, never get out of their mind. Nigel, you might fall into that potentially. We might see you at least with a, you know, a part-time residence here at some point. Because again, that humanity, that authenticity, that culture, once you get used to it, uh, you miss it when it's gone uh, because there's something very human you know, about it. Um, but for one third of people, um, they would really much more prefer to be in, in, in Singapore or Abu Dhabi or Dallas, and they're, they're not going to swing with this. And that's okay. That, that's fine. But what everybody will find is um, an authenticity. Uh, when somebody says to you, how are you doing? They actually care. It's not just being said because it wasn't the employee handbook. Uh, they're going to find um, a richness of culture because of its history that is unique mm -hmm. in, the, in the world. Um, they're gonna find one of the, in many ways, least ageist, uh, least gendered, uh, most accepting communities in America. Uh, I'll give you an example. My, you know, my son is, 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 is a cook. He's done a bunch of the reality cooking shows. He's been cooking professionally here, not necessarily legally since he was eight. Um, and one of the wonderful things is that you're expected to be able to know your way around the kitchen in, Louisiana, whether you're two or 82. Um, if you go to Jazz Fest, you're going to see people from two to 82 all having a good time. Um, most of them with their shirt off. Maybe they shouldn't, but, you know, um, laissez le bon temps. Um, and so in that way, it's very inclusive and accepting. On the other side, you're going to find a place that is highly imperfect. You're going to find the challenges of weather, which manifests itself not only in occasional hurricanes, but uh, in potholes in the streets because of soil subsidence. You're going to find uh, a community where there's really not an affordability problem. It's actually a quite an affordable place, uh, but a, a wealth problem. Uh, we need to build a bigger middle class here. Um, crime was getting much, much better uh, pre-COVID. We were at a 50-year low, but along with many of the cities of America, we've had a surge uh, in the time since, since COVID. Um, we have infrastructure challenges. Um, although our flood surge protection infrastructure now is some of the best in the world, our stormwater management system is 100 years old and needs to be uh, basically replaced. So what I would say is that for individuals that want um, to have a place they can connect to and relate to almost as a sentient being, New Orleans provides that in an extraordinary way, and um, and it's addictive. It's 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 wonderful. But for individuals that want um, a life that is um, God, there's no way to say this without sounding like a snob. But who want a life that is um, yes, more it, packaged? You know that it's just uh, horses for courses. And some individuals are going to find that a newer city uh, that it is is simpler and has a less complex history and culture is just going to make them more at home, then that's fine. What, what I would say though, and, and this is part of my job, is that the New Orleans that we've been talking about today is really the old New Orleans, the urban core. I'm looking out at my window right here. Uh, in the New Orleans region, which is what we represent, 1.4 people, you have uh, new communities, you have suburbs that look like the woodlands you know, in Houston. And then you have rural communities where you have horses and cows. Um, and so you actually can have those experiences in a very affordable environment, but then access this culture. And that really is the right way to do it, to live in the right part, whether it's in the French Quarter or out in the country, depending on your preferences or the time of your life, and, and be able to have it all. And that's the New Orleans arbitrage, I guess I would say. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's something which... 
it, for me, it's it's you you can't you know the one of the things that makes it magical is that there are it is difficult in New Orleans. It isn't all easy, and 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 to your point that it may not be for everybody, but that is also what makes people creative and artistic and. It uh, gives them an outlet is because things aren't perfect. And, you know, how can you sing the blues unless you experience the blues to some extent, right? I, I, I always say that it's not, not called the happies. <clears throat> so, right. Um, you're, 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 you're right. But I think that, you know, one of the big questions that we have, and I'd actually like your perspective on this as an artist, is people say, um, how can we both, uh, improve conditions, remediate the challenges without losing our culture. And it basically comes down to um, the, this question of gentrification and what does gentrification really mean? And basically, can you balance progress without destroying the, um, the essence that's made that progress possible? Um, and I've got some th thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear what you think as a you know, I mean, I, I've got to say, I mean, I'm someone who, you know, I moved to New York in the early 90s and I was first in the East Village. Then I moved to the meatpacking district when it was really the meatpacking district. And, you know, it was uh, sort of full of houses of, of ill repute and what have you. And um, it, it was sort of somewhat dangerous to some extent. Um, and, um, you know, I remember my, my, my mother coming to visit me and sort of saying, my God, why are you living here? This is an awful place to live. And I'm like, Mom, this is going to be the coolest, most hip place ever. It's full of all the top photographers and artists and cool people and, and what have you. But, you know, gentrification comes along and, you know, and then housing prices go up. And all, before you know it, you know, the bars are turning into fashion shops and then turning into Apple stores. And, you know, it's what people want. It's what people need. It's the sort of that move and of course the artists get priced out and they move out too and they move to Brooklyn and then they move somewhere else and then they go to Austin or wherever it might be and they sort of move around and that is also this the change of the world I mean no one place is is likely to hold on to being the sort of artist's home forever because by the by the nature of it artists are broke to some extent and certainly young ones are <clears throat> and they're looking for places where they are where they can be free and you know, with gentrification comes control, and so therefore, if you're controlling, you're gonna that's stem stemize the the artist in you, and so you're looking for a place which is somewhat out of control or free or spontaneous or think anything can kind of happen, which is both dangerous too. But that that shake of danger is also what makes things exciting, and it's one of the things that. You know, when I was a young man and I went to New Orleans and I met the guys with guns strapped to their ankles and God knows what else, I was also titillated by the fact of what could happen here, right? And there is all of that is a part of the experience. And of course, one wants to change that because you have families and everyone grows up and the hipsters become the dads and they're pushing strollers before you know it. And they weren't, they're not, you know, necessarily DJing anymore. But, you know, but but I think at the same time, you know. That doesn't mean it can't be fun and it can't be a great place to live and it can't have you know a, a culture and a history it's just changed so to your point i'm not sure that you can hold on to the artists at all times but you can hold on to a fun loving spirit you can hold on to great food you can hold on to um certain parts of the magic and the history is there you know i think history is authentic and it, it is something that you can't change you can rewrite it and you can you can describe it in different ways and, and what have you, but it's still history. And a lot of places don't have history and therefore don't have a real um, sort of something special that makes them unique. It's, you know, you, if you create a, a tower block, it's got no history, but an old building that's been there, even if it's got, you know, problems or bad plumbing or bad electric or bad whatever, there's stories that are all over it that are a, a part of it. and. You know, somewhere like New Orleans, it, you know, it has that in abundance and you can never get rid of that. That history is there. Like you mentioned, it's West African, it's Haitian, it's, uh, it's French, English, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, I mean, it's in the food, it's in the music, it's it's in the water, literally. I mean, you know, you, you can't get away from it. And, and I think that's something that's very special about New Orleans, which, you know, and I feel like Austin, Texas, Austin has a sort of a vibe of that too, that, you know, it's one of the reasons why so many artists like to go there. And I experienced it years ago when I went to Austin, you know. Yeah. No, you, you, the, the, the great quote I heard about that, I agree with you completely, is there's a guy at Tulane called Richard Campanella, great demographer, geographer. And he said that 
cities exist in dynamic equilibrium like a bicycle, which means either they're moving and stable or they stop moving and they wobble and fall over. And you can kind of think about maybe Detroit, you know, after the loss of the auto industry, it kind of stopped moving and it wobbled and fall over. Now it's beginning to move and change again. And it's got some stability and momentum. Uh, and, and I thought that was profound. And by the way, I was living in, in the East village in the mid nineties. I was on, uh, I was on um, 11th street and um, I was uh, a few years ago, the daughter of, I think his name was, uh, Peter Asian, the guy who founded the tunnel and the limelight yeah. and club USA, yeah. which don't say a word. I know you remember. Um, she came and stayed with us here in new Orleans and she walked in and her, you remember her father, he was the guy with the, the eye patch, the Canadian. I do. Um, and, uh, and I said, uh, Oh yeah, your, <laughs> your father changed my life. <laughs> Not necessarily for the better, but, um, I, uh, that was, a time, but then of course it got kind of sanitized and look, you know, maybe what's happened with COVID is going to be a little bit of a reset for New York and make Manhattan, you know, a little bit more affordable and maybe drive out some of the shit and maybe bring back a little bit of, um, of what was there before and, you know, re reset it to some degree. So I, I want to get to, before I let you go, because it's all, I can't believe the time is already passing by, but we, one of the most exciting things that, that it seems to be on your resume, it, although we haven't even spoken about it, it, is the fact that you by night are a DJ and DJ El Camino. I mean, for God's sakes, the El Camino is one of my, probably one of my all time favorite American cars. It, it, it's because it's the most weird looking kind of, I don't really mean, I don't really rude to all those people who love Caminos, and I'm sure you do, and as do I, but it does have this weird thing where it is a sort of a car and a truck combined, which, and then it's not even a big truck, it's a sort of small flat truck, and it's, it doesn't seem to work. It's sort of like a, a, a horse and an ass stuck together, stuck together but, but it works, and it's, it's so quintessentially American. Original hybrid, right? It was American muscle with Italian lines. Um, it was, it was a, uh, an SUV way ahead of its time. Um, it was a it was a, a, a an incredibly thoughtless vehicle because you put the biggest production engine of all time, sending all of its powers to the back wheels at only at twenty percent of the weight of the car. So it was very good at going straight, very bad. Um, I, I've got a nineteen seventy uh, four fifty four SSL Camino that, uh, that that I love driving on the weekends, um, and it gets uh, you know as I say terrible mileage wonderful smileage and um you know i my my music that i enjoy playing is also hybrid uh mashup music um i i got into music actually following my head in um playing rugby um i actually <clears throat> found that i would start listening to really heavy um industrial music and kind of um it was the era of like i don't know the prodigy and Katie FDM and Throbbing Gristle and Nine Inch Nails and uh, got into playing and producing and uh, here in New Orleans still enjoy doing it because, you know, in New Orleans, everybody's expected to play some type of instrument. Uh, typically, it's a brass instrument, but I find that this is probably the only city in the country where I could do this job and DJ and it's actually not you know, career limiting, it's career enhancing. Um, I played a show a few weeks ago with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra and Big Frida. And um, look, Big Frida is, is a great example of what makes New Orleans so special. You know, here we have a trans woman, a uh, huge six foot two, 225, who's invented and really uh, popularized a new genre of music bounce. And she is celebrated by everybody, young and old, white and black, straight and gay because of her spirit and because of her uniqueness and being able to play uh, next to that, be part of that is just a delight. And um, I think that's, if I would conclude what makes New Orleans so special, particularly in a world today where there's so much going on that's uncertain and challenging is that every New Orleans delivers uh, uh, something that's delightful. And that's reason to get out of bed in the morning. No, no doubt, doubt. And, and I love the fact that, you know, someone who's a, as yourself, a CEO of a company, an entrepreneur, but also a DJ and, uh, and a musician, that for me is the perfect combination. And everybody out there, 
if you think you can only have to be one thing or if you're one thing you can't be another this is proof that that is not the case and i can say firsthand that some of the best um, most successful people who i know personally even here in new york city are also djs at heart and musicians at heart and uh and i'm talking guys at goldman sachs at uh, uh, top financiers right. who, dj Saul, if you're listening i want to play off i got you right and so you know you'd be surprised how you know that, that, that there's all these different parts to all of us and we know there is every one of us knows there is but we try to we bury them for some odd reason we don't allow ourselves we sort of grow up out of it and we forget what it means to actually be free and that is what this great country is built on. And, and actually, we have to remember that, that this is our life and we, you know, we have to live the best life possible. And, and, and that means doing the things we want to do. And, and you know, if, if you're a CEO, then congratulations for becoming one. But don't forget the fact that you also love music and you love to play games and you love to be, you know, a, a, just a regular Joe and, and, and have fun with it. And that's all so important. And I, I love the fact that you're doing that. It, it's amazing. So congratulations on, on the balance. If, if well, nothing else thank you nigel i mean you know um it, it's uh it gets messy at times but uh, there's a lot of joy involved and you know I, I'll, I'll leave you with a story um you know about new orleans it kind of speaks to that that joy and that expression i was taking a tech company uh around new orleans and i was trying to sell them on expanding here or moving here and i picked them up um from the hotel in the french quarter and they said michael i don't know what was going on but uh, what you know what day was it yesterday we saw these these guys you know running around the french quarter you know in, in tutus and i said what day was it tuesday there you go <laughs> that's a good one i like that um i've got one more thing before i let you go last orders on the shaken and stirred show quick um quick fire questions here but if you could drink any cocktail from any movie or television show with any character from that show uh what would it be and who would it be with Oh, wow. Um, anyone. Um, okay, I'll go back a little bit. How about a Japanese whiskey with uh, with, with Bill Murray uh, back with uh, Lost in Translation? Remember that one? In, in Lost in Translation? Yeah, yeah, with Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, I love that movie. That's one, yeah, that's so one of my, I, I think I quote from that movie more than any other movie ever made, I think. Yeah, I, thought, I think Bill Murray didn't get, get enough acclaim for that role. It was a, it was a really pretty film. And just a very quiet film, and it worked, right? hundred percent. Who would play you in the movie of your life? I'd like to know. That's an interesting one. Oh man, um, Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and why? Because I, I guess, kind of for narcissistic reasons, I think that kind of we look alike a little bit, and uh, and it, you know, and he's just like ridiculous, and Iron Man, and he's ridiculous. Uh, there we go and he's ridiculous i like that you said that three times up it's perfect uh fantasy dinner party you can have three guests dead or alive who would they be oh god uh well the beastie boys you know rest in peace mca the beastie boys early beastie boys right back you know back in in the in the 80s when they were kind of still you know doing punk and thinking about what they were going to be when they were making license to ill which would have been what, like 80, 86, 87, 88. MCA, Mike D. Yeah. So that's it. Ad just just the, you and the BC boys. No one yep. else. Yep. That's, that's, the, that's the unique. It's the first time on this show, I, I, over 100 episodes, that someone has answered with one band. I happen to have three members. I love that. That's very. That's I mean, very I could tell you, I could tell you, you know, Ben Franklin, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton. I want to talk about the Constitution. You've nah, heard that before, nah, right? The Beastie Boys. I love it. Nah. We're going with the Beastie Boys. Let's stay there. So obviously you've got to have this down. Your, what's your go-to song you put on when you have a drink? Ah, so here's, this one's a little bit interesting. This is um, Pavlonian for me. So back when we were in the restaurant business in San Francisco, uh, the opening song for every night, and then when I DJ, the song that I use to tune the system is Lebanese Blonde by Thievery Corporation. So I actually get like oral contact high from that song. Like as soon as that song comes on, I feel like I have like a glass of Sancerre in my hand. Like I feel like that's my signal that the night is beginning. It's the, you know, it's like hearing Gershwin when you get on to, what is it, United Airlines, right? It's the, yeah, so it would be Thievery Corporation, Lebanese Blonde, still sounds good. 
I don't know what, that must be from the mid nineties, but that whole genre, still, all the music out of Bristol, Portishead, Massive Attack, <clears throat> all that music was just wonderful. Yeah, no, my go-to as well, actually, I'm right there with you, a big mid nineties kind of guy and Massive Attack has, uh, you know, defined my, me meeting my wife actually pretty much was a, uh, Sort of, you know, Massive Attack was one of our go-to albums at that time. Ninety-four was one. How, of how, how'd you meet an Alabama girl? That's another long story. It's a podcast for me, I think, right there. But we're, she, she's been on the show. But um, long story short, I met her in Milan um, as a model, and um, I was a photographer, and we we met mid nineties and fell in love, and I chased her all around the world, ended up in New York, and um, but uh, she has family, a sister, and what have you, and, and two are still down in, in Alabama, and we go there a couple of times a year, so. Love, love the South. Big fan. It's great. I, 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 lived, I lived in Milan in, uh, in 90, 94. I lived on Via Albrici, uh, Pearl Duomo. So that's so bizarre. I lived in Milan in 94 as well. That's when I met her. So we lived on uh, Via Virgilio yeah. um, down in Porto Genoa. Yeah, here you go. Milano è brutto, but I think it's better now. It was a little bit, you know, there was the whole glamour scene. I used to escape for the weekends. I'd rent a car and go snowboarding up in the Dolomites. Life was difficult. Right, I know. Those are good times. Very, very much so. So final question for you. Shaken or stirred? Oh, I mean, here I guess there's really only one classic answer, which is which is shaken, not stirred, right? I don't know. It depends what you're making, but you know, I'll take it. You and Bond. Yeah, I mean it's a, I know, I know it's cliche, but it's 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 but it's bond. And it's it's classic bond, right? It's like Dr. No Bond, right? And I don't know if the whole thing about bruising the gin is really true, but if 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 I if I I can demonstrate emphatically my masculinity by shaking a cocktail, much easier than strapping a gun to my ankle. You know, it's all about the stir. If you can stir it and still be masculine, then you've really got something going on. Is what I'm saying. Through that, <laughs> I just don't know if I'm actually at that level. I might just go, you know, go for the. Michael Hex, thank you so much for coming Shake on the Shaken and Stirred yeah. show. Really appreciate it. Guys, check out Greater New Orleans Inc. and absolutely DJ El Camino. If you are in New Orleans, you've got to check him out. DJLCamino.com. It is worth the look. You've got a great music video on there, by the way. And I, I actually really loved it. I, I watched the whole damn thing and I'm like, you know what? I like this music. I'd like to hang out and, and listen to you guys play. Well, look, Nigel, next time you're down here, uh, we'd, we'd love to see you and, uh, and you know, buy you a cocktail in person. And I uh, can't tell you how much I appreciate the time and you giving this, uh, you know, this chance for us to talk about this very special place uh, to all your audience. So thank you for, for what you do and for being a friend of, of New Orleans. A hundred percent. Michael Hecht, everybody. Um, check us out on the Shaken and Stirred show on Instagram at Shaken and Stirred show, as well as on YouTube. And uh, we'll be back next week with another fantastic guest. Michael, thanks so much. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Nigel. This podcast was produced and edited by Embassy Row.